Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and it's an absolute honor to be here in Singapore and speak at ATF. And I noticed when I uh, when they give me the bag of the speaker kit, and then I have two badges. One says speaker, China, and then participant, United Kingdom. So I think that perfectly describes my company, IPCN, is Angular Chinese Rice Distribution and Media Company. So, Crack China Open with High Heels, why the title? Uh, a good friend of mine who's uh, one of the producers behind King Speech, and he asked me once, he said, why it's so hard to crack China? Then I joked, I said, because you're not wearing high heels and then you can't find the right pressure point. Um, so yeah, I mean, in my mind, when it comes to the media and entertainment sector, it's not about entering in force, it's all about cleverness, it's all about skills. Um, I guess that's exactly how my humble company, IPCN, is rocking the show in the PRC. So first of all, let me show you a quick clip of my company. natural modesty would prevent such boastfulness and I however have to say that IPCN has re-established the uh, former licensing business in China. Um, as many of you experienced or still experiencing the negative environment of rights infringement, um, there was not such a concept of licensing a format pre IPC, and I know this is quite a statement, but as I go through the presentation perhaps you will agree with me. We have brokered the first format deal for most all the major global content providers, from Endmo to, uh, to Shine, from Fremantle to Objective Productions, from Banijay to Nippon TV, and from NBC Universal to Taupa, you name it. So with more than half billion viewers, uh, yes, with more than half billion viewers, IPCN was the protagonist behind two hit shows, China's Got Talent and The Voice of China. So I think for that, it deserves uh, an award of patriotism. So I hope President Xi is watching this. Um, with the continued effort, I believe we're making big changes in that market. From state broadcaster monopoly to popularize the provincial satellite Chinese televisions, from straight television scheduling to seasonal programming, from re-energizing the broadcast in-house production to fast-track the separation between broadcast and production, independent production, from the secondary sales to new media platform to making the new media platform actually as a content provider then resell it back to the traditional television, uh, we at IPCN, as Chairman Mao said, crossing the river by touching a stone. So deep or shallow, slowly and gradually we are making changes, the changes that bring all of us opportunity. So I noticed in this year's ATF, there are quite a few sessions dedicated to China. Mysterious, yet tempting. Distant, yet palpable. Open, yet closed. So China, China, China is a market that is not, you know, we cannot take this market um, more seriously nowadays. A very young, talented Dutch boy made, uh, in my office made the graphics for me uh, for this presentation. And then he said China to him is like a roller coaster, up and down, exciting, exhilarating, yet seriously requires stability and longevity. So I went and uh, gathered some data and numbers for you guys. And when a woman on high heels quotes your numbers, uh, make sure you take some notes. So 
Uh, according to PCW, from an investment point of view, China's entertainment and media sector demonstrates significant opportunities. Global entertainment media uh, spending will increase from 1.6 trillion US dollars in 2011 to 2.1 trillion in 2016. And China will be the fastest growing region for entertainment uh, and media industry, at a 12% increase from 2012 to 2016, compared to US at 5.2% and Japan at 2.8%. With regards to TV market, which is what we're talking about today, China's TV market has experienced a tremendous growth over the last few years, with broadcasting revenue increasing from 10 billion US dollars in 2004 to 33 billion in 2010. China has over 4,000 TV production companies and became the top drama producing country by number in 2005. Annual TV drama production is around 400 series and that is 14,000 episodes. However, in 2011, only 8,000 episodes made it to TV broadcast. And take a look at the bigger screen, which hopefully uh, is quite interesting for us, uh, as there's a session tomorrow uh, dedicated to Chinese film. In 2010, there were 5,105 uh, 5, film screens in China with 1.6 billion of revenues. Total revenue film market expected to exceed 6 billion by 2015. And the Film Bureau at the State Animist, uh, at SAFT, basically, uh, of the people of China, reported that the gross box office for 2011 reached 2 billion, an increase of 28.9% uh, uh, from 1.6 billion in 2010. And China now is the number three film market in the world, just behind US and Japan. And Five of uh, top studio films derive 10% of their worldwide box office revenue from mainland China, a sure sign of China's increasing importance in the global film market. And the new media. In 2011, China's new media internet market size is 746 million. And in 2012, the growth rate will be 29.1%. So, as you can know, I'm not very good at numbers, so I'll just quote you some, uh, something and, you know, I did my research on, but translate them into values that we all understand. Uh, 11th of November, which is 11th of 11th, which is known as the uh, Singles Day in China, whether that's just an excuse for you to get another girl or boy, nobody cares, but somebody do care is Taobao or Alibaba. Within 24 hours, Alibaba's uh, shopping fiesta has generated a revenue of 19.1 billion. RMB, and that is 3 billion US dollars. That includes 13.2 13, 13 billion from Tianmao.com and 5.9 billion from Taobao.com. Now you understand why dating show is probably one of the better, you know, biggest format in China. So I guess that's why I'm here with such attractive market, you know, from the tech, um, you know, with the technology and platform inventing themselves faster than life speed, uh, China needs content. So hopefully I'm share here sharing some of our experiences of how to make the money out of my country and perhaps from a content and then um, from a former and content exploitation point of view. So once upon a time. In 2005, a rather astonished news announced that foreign companies are allowed to set up uh, invest in TV productions in China through Sino foreign uh, corporations. However, in JVs, foreign companies can only have the minority share, uh, shares and are subject to very strict regulations. Meanwhile, China has to a degree open its satellite TV channels uh, to foreign companies. Foreign satellite channels like CNN, BBC, MTV are labeled to enter China through the broadcast landing rights, but only to three-star uh, about hotels and gated communities. So all of a sudden, many, many acquisitions and JV conversations uh, kind of sprouted across China, uh, but a very few, in, uh, you know, but however, nothing really bared any fruit. Uh, even those a few entities that managed to sign their names on the dotted line um, all kind of fell through eventually. Uh, the aggressive takeover of Qinghai TV, as many of you know, you know, become a costly failure. So just as the big deals and a wish for thinking crumbles and the rights situation remains um, pessimistic. 
and the infringement were still very, very serious. But what is more fundamental was the self-originated or self-created uh, TV show Supergirl become a national sensation, but many argue that was an imitation of the Idols format. So in 2006, an Englishman named Mick Desmond, who was the ex-CEO of ITV Broadcasting, who is now my business partner, became the international consultant to Hunan TV, which is the biggest entertainment channel uh, in China at the time. Uh, Mick took Mr. Ouyang, the president um, of Hunan TV, to see the CEO of Freeman, to Tony Cohen. An interesting conversation took place that day, and the debate was whether there was super growth before idols or vice versa. Uh, needless to say, the, converse, uh, the dinner afterwards the, it was not very enjoyable, but a very important decision was made. Uh, Mr. Ouyang declared that from now on, Hunan is going to take the lead to respect IP rights, to take the lead of licensing format, and imitate programs legally. Um, so the Chinese broadcaster no longer wants to be the frog at the bottom of the whale, only sees the skies above. They want to learn, they want to reinvent themselves, and they want a change. So right on time, a new generation of media people surfaced, born and bred in China, foreign educated, professionally trained, legally savvy, and now is the time to change um, uh, to change attitude into recognition, to make recognition into business and build the business into a sustainable industry. So in 2007, Mr. Mike Morley, the uh, commercial director at the time at Endemo, uh, made a bet with us and gave us one versus 100 as a trial to secure the exclusive representation deals with Endemo. And three months later, 16 episodes was commissioned and that marked the first proper formal licensing deal in China. So the early days, um, I recall a question, a Dutch lady uh, who was a sales manager at the global company that I was working with asked me, she said, why does my company bother to do business with China? I mean, exactly, because it was high investment, low return. And, you know, but that was an unfortunate situation at the beginning of this journey. We had to fly in a production consultant to a pitch meeting because the salespeople were no longer convincing enough to sell a format. After a long haul flight landed in Shanghai, it was not, hand, it was not a pre-meeting but handed over a running kit because we have to join the head of the channel for a Nike 10 kilometer run. All the drinkings and relationship workings, it did cost an arm and leg to deliver just one deal that translates to less than six digit figures in US dollars. So the beginning is always the hardest, but however, starting from a blank piece of paper, we see a different angle in terms of flexibility and opportunity. The first TV formal licensing agreement was 70 pages, I remember vividly. And the Chinese broadcaster wants us to translate into Chinese, obviously, but more challenging, they wanted to be within 15 pages. And that template shortened back then become a template of um, the TV format license agreement nowadays in China. And I remember some interesting sort of episodes when localizing the legal contract. First of all, there's no act of God. There's no God in China. And also, the, I, was, I was negotiating a rerun uh, license fee. The head of channel argued with me. She said, I said, by IP law, when one contributes to the making a show, then she or he automatically owns the copyrights of the end product. So it is up to me whether I want to show it to my cousin or my grandma and how many times I'm going to show it to. So many may argue it's a commercial decision other than a legal debating. So therefore, even now, we fight very hard for the copyrights of the local version and then trying to persuade the licensor to assign the rights back to the licensee license, licensor back. You know what I mean. So set the rules and the mutual respect. The world's first TV format, apparently I read, so, uh, was, uh, was sold 60 years ago when What's My Line was sold for 50 US dollars. And that is the price, perhaps two cocktails at Maryland Bay Sand Hotels nowadays. But the value of format is staggering now. Forbes recently valued um, American Idol at 2.5 billion US dollars, format trade now is a standout phenomenon of television and audiovisual industry. And what makes it fascinating is 
From a legal perspective, there is still nowhere in the world where existence of a TV format is recognized expressly by statute. So with the example I just told with you, um, our negotiation is more commercially driven other than legally based. So for what I still consider as an embryonic market, you know, China can be easy or hard, it depends how you navigate yourselves around. So trust and relationship lays the foundation for mutual respect and which creates a fair environment for rules to be set, to be made and compliant. So in other words, the emerging market gives all of us, all of us opportunities to set rules and uh, on the basis of mutual respect between the licensor and the licensee. So from a business angle, from a content selection an angle, and uh, I guess from a production consultancy angle as well, it is not your way or my way, it is, it is not, it's, it's not no way or my way, it's not going into the production uh, set and tell people what not to do. This type of attitude would only arouse resentfulness. So like any business, uh, when you have a good product, the negotiation power is much greater. So when it comes to China, it's not only about having the good product, but also the right product. I remember having a coffee with a, with a senior minister at Saft, and he enlightened me by saying, there are three things you shouldn't do. You should not challenge Saft's intelligence. You should not challenge Saft's uh, uh, patience. And you should not challenge Saft's borderline. So I think these are the rules at IPC and that we keep when we select the right content. There are something we call maybe content. There are something we call risky but potential, like dating a duck, for example. And there's something we call no-no format that we just have to tell our content providers, unfortunately, just give up your pipe dream of getting that show into China. With a massive geographic plan, uh, span, provinces differentiate it from one to another. So a war-themed drama will top the reaching chart on one channel, might just fail on the other. The humor amuses the northeastern audience may not make the people laugh in the southeast uh, of China. So we keep learning new things as we keep going and then kind of tailoring our services, what I call a bespoke service that is willing to listen and willing to accommodate. So all in all, a main strategy for the first half of China's economy reform is for the Chinese government and society to adjust uh, our own rules and regulations to what's called the international standard. However, with the economy growth, not for long, I think China will have its own rules, if not underlying rules, that will become so powerful that will change the mentality and habit of those giant companies and then change their habit, change those people who are so used to the international standard that they created. As I said, China's got talent. Um, many argues in China that created the sort of before and after situation of formal licensing. Before you probably sell one show a year, after there are loads of shows just literally happened within weeks. 2010 Shanghai Expo, the whole world is focusing in Shanghai and the government has allocated much more budget to promote the city, promote the culture the city embraces. And Shanghai Media Group was the, well, was provide, uh, playing a vital role in the whole propaganda. The Cultural Bureau at the time is asking for a major variety show to celebrate the festivity of the city and the IPC has brought SMG Got Talent. With an average rating of 0.6, while Hunan TV I mentioned earlier was at 1.3, so Dragon was actually at lower bottom of the provincial satellite TV, so no one believed that Got Talent was the right show for the right channel. So from the big boss of Starcom in London to the big boss of P&G in Cincinnati, from the commercial director at SMG to the American lady who's look after the regional buy-in of uh, P&G in Guangzhou, there are so many people involved, there are so many moving parts, everyone is looked through their own lenses, media agency from a media value point of view, brand agency from a brand equity, brand value point of view, and the, the, the channel just concerned about the ratings because there are so many copy hack already there. So before China's Got Talent existed, there was Chinese has talent. So 
IBC glued everybody together and fast tracked the contract signing with, within weeks. But only would I know that was just the beginning of the whole thing. So for the first series, we had to step in to protect the creative integrity of the show. Because after the great performance for the first few ep uh, episodes, the, uh, the product, local production team decided to change the whole show into a, you know, a kind of like che cheesy variety show with two, presenting, two presenters uh, fronting the show. And then in the second episode, because the success of the show, loads of people are copying it. You've got all sorts of different versions of Got Talents everywhere. So we had to deficit fund in the booking of Susan Boyle. And then inviting her to come and perform at the second series grand finale, kind of putting a seal of approval of this is the real Got Talent. And then in the third series, because the Got Talent was on prime time, everybody got a bit jealous, you know, why they got on prime time, blah, blah, blah. Then we had to master in the PRs. And we took the first winner, the armless pianist, Mr. Liu Wei, to London. And we had ex-Prime Minister, ex -Prime Minister Tony Blair's wife, Sherry Blair, and a famous uh, Chelsea player, Frank Lampa, come and meet and greet him to, in, you know, to sing in the praises of his bravery and his kind of strength. And those messages fly back to China, and the government loves it, and then it further endorse the program. So in short, licensing a format, major format like this, is not about signing the contract, but it's really about all the details, all the nurturing the show step by step, to manage all the complicated relationships, and to anticipate all the challenges and hurdles hidden ahead. Voice of China. Obviously, 2002, since all about the voice, sold more than 50 territories. John de Moy is enjoying a, a global triumph, I'm sure. But after nearly 18 months, 18 months of selling and pitching, we managed to, we, we, managed, we licensed the, uh, we actually licensed the show from Taupa back in 2010, but we sub-licensed to start China 18 months later, and that was how long it took for me to sell this show. And, Instead of telling you, repeating the story of how we get in approval from Soft, how we were fighting copycats, you know, how we again, you know, stand strong on the title, China's uh, Voice of China, Zhongguo Hao Shengyin, because Zhongguo, the character China, does not often get permitted uh, for use, usage of TV uh, program names. Instead, I like to tell you the story of two red cans, which one of them played a vital role for the whole show, what well, realized the project. So you would probably expect that we will have no problem attracting sponsorship for this type of show, globally successful. Everybody probably will queue up sponsoring the show. But unfortunately, there was none. After a very promising sponsorship lead fell through, literally weeks before transmission, everyone panicked. And uh, the domestic herbal tea, Jia Duobao, came to rescue us and invested 60 million RMB, that's nearly 10 million US dollars to be the title sponsorship, and that's how much things worth nowadays over there. The reason for such a rapid decision is because Jia Zhou was at a crucial time to fight against another product called Wang Laoji, and they want to differentiate themselves from it, they want to fast track the brand awareness within the country. So just to give you a bit of background why they were fighting a little bit of history lesson here. So back in 1830, that's Qing Dynasty, a humble Chinese man called Wang Laoji invented the herbal tea. And in 1949, Wang Laoji was separated into two companies. One is the Guangzhou Wang Laoji, a Guangzhou-based state-owned enterprise. And the other one is Jia Duobao, which is a family-run business uh, in Hong Kong by the descendants of Mr. Wang. And in 1995, Guangzhou Wang Laoji licensed the usage of the red can and the logo of Wang Laoji to Jia Duobao and they made it a hugely successful business. But in 2010, the license ran out. So a huge difference in future strategy. Um, basically, it parted them and then they go into a severe battle. Because in theory and uh, in fact, Jia Dobao's red can, Jia Dobao's herbal tea, consists of the original recipe of the Wang family from hundreds of years ago. So that is the real deal. So with Zhejiang TV, we very quickly captured this opportunity by creating a slogan, the real herbal tea, the real good voice. So emphasizing on the essence of the real deal. 
So after one phone call, here's 60 million RMB. Without the Jadobao's investment, Star China, the local production team, wouldn't invest what they call it the blockbuster budget. And without this budget, they wouldn't be able to get the top judges, would not be able to get the best live band, would not be able to get the sound engineering who worked at the uh, Beijing Olympic 2008, and they were not going to be able to spend money to literally import the four chairs all the way from London that was used at the BBC version of The Voice, because they just don't want anything to go wrong. Everything has to be perfect. So without the investment, the quality will suffer, the quality will suffer, the show will suffer, everybody suffered. And it was indeed a brief gamble by Star China. Instead of getting the production fee and get the performer fee, they went to the Zhejiang TV and said, uh, look, we're going to fund the show, and we're going to promise you a high rating. And instead, I want more than 50% shares of the revenue generated from the show. And eventually, the show generated nearly 300 million RMB. That's 48 million US dollars. So this show has significantly shaken the Chinese market, and The Voice was definitely the show in 2012. And then more importantly is the um, social events everybody tweeted. So if you're not on Weibo, if you're not talking about Voice, you're so out. You know, you're going to be the loser beating Lomas when you go to work on Monday. So it's literally the social event, and even my mother was interviewed by a local newspaper back in my hometown, and the title goes, Daughter Brings in Voice, Mother Worries About Rating. So, so who is the real hero behind this? Is it Taupa who created this great format? Or is it IPCN insisted the production company to license the format when they had almost no interest in it at the time but X Factor? In that, is that the emotional speech by myself, Mr. Tian, the CEO of Star, Mr. Sha, the president of Zhejiang, in front of SAFT to get them to give us the prime time slot while the rest of the talent show were scheduled at off-peak? Or is it my colleague Yuan who, and his team constantly working and make sure the alteration, the local alteration kept at a minimum and they should stay true to its format and manage all the relationships as always? Or is it Zhejiang TV that puts all the inventory to promote the show is a star production that literally didn't sleep for months to make the show, or is it Jado Bao literally invested millions of RMB based on one phone call and brought us this huge PR story? Uh, maybe in a complicated market like China, there's no one real heroes, um, but a group of trusted partners who are always behind you and watching your back for you. So. Selling format to China, is it one night stand or is it going to be a long term relationship? Um, I guess China's got talent and now the voice, the former licensing is now ever effervescent business in China. But then the market will fluctuate, it will expand and it will contract because of the market condition, the cultural interest and then China's ambition to originating. If I were going to take an estimation, I would say there are about dozens of uh, pr provincial satellite TVs that has licensed the format in the last few years, but only a handful were successful. If you read Chinese, then you can do a bit of a research on the internet, and you will read many interesting articles about licensing a format from abroad, some negative, some positive. As you know, success has many masters. So the happy buyers, obviously, seeing the praises of licensing a format, they claim they bought the format, they bought the reputation, they bought the production know-how, and they bought the whole business model of content exploitation. But then you have broadcasters licensed major, famous, famous international titles, but then didn't work out. So once by twice shy, they literally went back to plagiarism, went back to copy. And then you have industry experts give a death sentence to situation comedies because it just says humor doesn't translate from one, na one nation to another. And you have academics shouting about how importing foreign formats is co killing our own creativity. So before we made Voice of China a success, I was like literally worrying that I'm not going to be able to sell another Taupas format because Dating the Duck was curtailed after a few episodes. And uh, I love my country. First year, uh, first series went on to Sichuan TV, wasn't so successful. And Sing It was just not big enough for PNG to invest again. So it is still very skeptical of licensing a format in market, and the life for a salesman is still pretty tough. 
So it's co-creating and co-developing the way forward, I believe is very, very challenging because the institutionalized infrastructure and the lack of skill sets and personal uh, incentives. Most of the people employed by Chinese broadcasters, they are civil servants. They don't get hired, they don't get fired. So the, and then also the immature IP protections also becomes a problem. So all those contribute to uh, the prohibition of delivering something tangible. Having said that, singing my own praises, I've seen it is actually co-creating, co-working something at the moment, and hopefully we'll keep pushing the boundary of uh, doing business in China. Maybe within uh, the circle of trust, as they call it, uh, may help. In this year's Edinburgh uh, Film Festival, there was a title um, saying, China, a long walk for short drinks. So I guess by now my presentation is coming to an end. You would guess that I will obviously change the, um, the statement. You know, it doesn't have to be a long walk for, a hot, for short drinks. Because in 2008, we organized a uh, media summit with the Media Garden at the British uh, Museum. It's called Create in China. And I made a closing spe uh, speech then and saying, China is not another planet. Its culture and history uh, created this type of unpredictability and complicity. So instead of decoding it, why not embrace it? And why not find your way through the foggy climate? Being a big country, uh, you know, with the nature of having fragmented market, instead of having a Pan-Asia strategy, like uh, Sylvia earlier said, you know, when they're doing their marketing plans, maybe it's a Pan-China theory. And I, another sort of analogy of mine, I said, don't get too focused on perfecting the Big Mac. What I meant by that, I remember I was talking to Liz Murdoch about um, Master Chef, and I said, in a country like China, when being a chef is not praised and celebrated, so why, you know, maybe Shan should look beyond perfecting the performance of Master Chef. So as a matter of fact, another Shine's format called Clash of the Choirs, which we recommended to CCTV One, became a, a quite a good uh, success. And simply because it's encouraging teamwork and encouraging people singing and giving back to the society. So what a better channel to be on CCTV One. So just like the McDonald's Big Mac in Shanghai, it, sells, it doesn't sell as well as the chicken burgers because you know, that's more appetizing to the Shanghainese. So earlier on in my presentation, I mentioned about astonishing sales figures of Alibaba during the uh, Singles Day. Uh, we produced a show called Date My Car, which is a Bunny J format with ICE.com, and that has opened doors for the uh, rights holders uh, with the online pa uh, platform, uh, platform players. Um, so over and beyond television, the, uh, the opportunity is definitely vast. And we're looking at the moment loads of interactivity shows, you know, shows that actually cross media. We're very much focusing on that sector as well. As I said, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here speaking at the, at the uh, conference because selling format into China is beyond commission, is beyond a TV commission. And I hope those real stories give you some insights for your journeys ahead. And then obviously 30 minutes is flashing, I know, and uh, it's not enough, long enough to summarize what IPC has, go through, has gone through in the last few years, but, but the following quotes, I think, sum it up pretty well. I'm just gonna read it out to you. In uncertainty markets like China, some companies constantly responded more quickly and effectively to shocks that threatened their very survival. They quickly seized the major opportunities that positioned themselves well for the future. During the periods of relative calm, they employed a dynamic approach to strategy, which is called active waiting, by constantly anticipating and responding to involving threats and opportunities just a little faster. So thanks for listening. And uh, when you're serious about China, come and talk to us. A round of applause, please, for Ms. Rebecca Young from IPCN. We have time for a couple of questions, so could I invite you to just take a seat? I'm sure we have questions from the floor. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Young? Good afternoon, Ms. Young. Vincent O'Donnell from Screen uh, Hub Australia. Two questions. First is the voice, Country X has got talent, and Country X Idol are all talent shows. They're all talent quests. That is a form of public entertainment that goes back to British vaudeville and much earlier. They are not of themselves unique. What then are the particular qualities of those three programs that give them distinct formats? That's the first question. The second is, if we had international recognition in law of a television format, 
would that be a break upon creativity in all our countries? Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Well, I guess there's three, fo three formats, X Factor, IDO, and The Voice. Yes, they're pretty much, you know, based on the concept of, you know, from obscurity to celebrity. Uh, IDO, first of all, is not in China, just for your information. And X Factor didn't quite do as well as expected. Because like, you know, like the U US, like the, you know, like the Americans, Chinese are quite patriotic. You know, it's like China's got talent, the voice of China. But when you, there's X Factor, it doesn't quite translate. Um, but when the voice of China came into the market, you know, one thing is quite unique, which is the celebrity culture. And because the Chinese celebrities, you know, they often quite, you know, hold themselves with high regards. And they often do not necessarily interact with each other. You know, they do not necessarily challenge each other. So it was very fresh for the Chinese audience to see how they kind of, you know, be friends with each other, how they were really trying to look for the, you know, the talents of the future. So it's, you know, it just brings all the sort of different and fresh elements to the show. Thank you for that question. Do you have any other questions from the floor? If there were to be an internationally agreed recognition of format in law, mm. and hence things like The Voice or X Factors or any TV program was, uh, became uh, a unique and defensible intellectual property, what breaks then might there be on the creation of new formats, given that most of our formats and uh, probably the, most, the, the, the newest format created for television would have been um, Big Brother? Given that they're all television is essentially variations on formats, what breaks on creativity would international recognition in law create? Well, I think that question is beyond me, really. You know, if there is, you know, there is going to be a law in future that protects the format, you know, makes format a recognition, then I guess you know the, the whole whole international market will benefit from it. You know. Uh, the recent news and says uh, there was a BBC show called Tonight is the Night. It was licensed to Zhejiang TV. And there was a big news uh, in China at the moment and says Zhejiang TV sells their own show, the dream show, back to BBC Worldwide. But really, as you said, it's just a variation of the same concept. So, you know, I guess, you know, going forward, if there is law protecting it, then there will be hopefully more creativity and more uniqueness coming out of it. Ms. Young, we have a, a question that's been SMSed for you. Question is, what is the next big formatted television show coming to China? Any trends to look out for in 2013? Everyone is looking for the next big voice. So it's really difficult to answer that question. I think everybody asks me the same question. Um, everybody wants a big show to make quick ratings, you know, everyone wants somebody to bank 60 million RMB to sponsor their show. All the broadcasters are looking for such thing. And as a matter of fact, you know, hopefully very soon we'll be launching So You Think You Can Dance. You know, that's, you know, hopefully another big show going into, going into the market. Um, but then other than that, I think with the new media um, involving so rapidly in our market. And uh, we are really looking for transmedia content that actually transform themselves from traditional TV to online. And I think that's going to take place perhaps even uh, more advanced and sooner than the other international, more mature market. Thank you for your presentation today, Ms. Young. Thank you for all the answers to all our questions. A round of applause, please, for Ms. Rebecca Young.